Use your Home Depot consumer credit card and get 10% off or up to 24 months special financing on all flooring right now. No more maybe or one day or let's wait and see. Carpet, tile, hardwood, vinyl, or laminate. Now the floor is yours. Let's do this. Save 10% or get special financing with your Home Depot credit card on any flooring purchase. More saving, more doing. That's the power of the Home Depot. Valid through April 15th, U.S. only. Subject to credit approval. Terms and conditions apply. Blog Talk Radio. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of The Grueling Truth. I'm your host, Mike Goodpaster, and as always, I would like to welcome in my co-host, Matt Andruscavage. Thanks a lot, Mike. Always uh, good to be here. I'm excited to talk about uh, the NFL and, uh, and many other things. Well, our guest tonight played for almost a decade in the NFL, one of the best fullbacks in the NFL, and I think played eight or nine years. Um, including helping the New England Patriots to win Super Bowl 36 as their starting fullback. I'd like everybody to welcome into the show Mark Edwards. Hey, yeah, glad to be here. And I, I'm not sure I was one of the best uh, fullbacks in the NFL, but I, I was serviceable for nine years. How's that? Oh, you were pretty good. I'm a Notre Dame <laughs> fan, though, so I'm biased. <laughs> welcome yeah. to the show, Mark. I, 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 no, hey, I'm very, hey, happy to be here, Matt. <laughs> Hey, well, we'll start off with that. You went to Notre Dame. I know you attended Norwood High School, where you said about every record known to man that I think still exists there. Um, but coming out of Norwood, what made you want to attend Notre Dame instead of like an Ohio State? Well, no- Notre Dame was the total package as far uh, that, that fit me the best. Uh, you know, it was within four hours of home, Notre Dame, and, you know, it, it had a uh, come off the national title in 88. I was 93, and, you know, they were competing for the national title, one of the top teams in the country every single year. Uh, I was going to be on national TV every single week. I knew I was going to get an education. I knew I was going to graduate. I knew there was a heck of an alumni network uh, for once I did graduate, uh, you know, because obviously, you know, in high school, yeah, you have dreams of playing in the NFL, but you don't really know where that's going to lead. But uh, overall, it was by far the best all-around place for me. The way that Holtz used the fullback was, uh, you know, what fit, fit my skill set just perfectly. And at Ohio, Ohio State at the time, that was back when John Cooper was there, and if I would have went to Ohio State, I would have been more of a mule blocker for Eddie George. I would have been a glorified offensive lineman in the backfield. I don't know if you remember, Nicky Sualua was the fullback uh, during during those years where, where, where I would have been there. And uh, he didn't touch the ball a whole lot. So it was a much better fit for me at Notre Dame where uh, Holt used a much more athletic fullback. Mark, welcome to the show tonight. Really glad to have you on. Um, who were some of the early influences you had – as a football player? Uh, well, I mean, obviously, uh, my high school coach had a lot to uh, – uh, influenced me quite a bit, Jim Barry. Uh, he, you know, he was uh, been in Norwood for, for 10, 10 or so years, and he uh, you know went on and he uh, coached Wyoming for, with his brother, Bernie Barry, uh, for a few years as well. But uh, he, he was a big influence. And he obviously, you know, Coach Earl Mosley, he was my running back coach at Notre Dame. Uh, as well as Coach Holtz. I mean, you know, we, we can talk more about him in a little bit. But uh, really, I think once I got to the pros, the guy that, that really helped me out the most was my running backs coach, my rookie and second year in San Francisco, which was Tom Rathman, who obviously was somebody that I looked up to uh, growing up uh, outside of, uh, you know, his 49ers beating my Bengals in 88. But uh, uh, I hear you. <laughs> yeah, 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 but uh, but, 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 but to the Tom, Tom really showed me what it took to be. I mean, at Notre Dame, I ran the ball real well. I caught the ball. You know, I blocked, you know, well enough. You know, but I wasn't a very good uh, lead blocker. You know, blowing a guy out of the hole. Uh, you know, I go and I cut a guy and I get the position block a guy real well. And I was strong enough uh, in, in college. You know, more, you know, stronger than those linebackers where I could uh, you know control them real well. Whereas I got the NFL, that wasn't going to work because you know, these guys were just animals. 
So he really, you know, that first, uh, you know, four or five weeks of the season, my rookie year, and, and really going into my second year when I was pressed in the starting role for the 49ers is, is you know, has really taught me how to how to be a lead blocker in the NFL, which was what which was you know what, what I was lacking. Uh, the the game I remember most from your career at Notre Dame would have probably been the '95 win over USC. I know Notre Dame was a big mm-hmm. underdog. I think it had been a while since USC had even beaten Notre Dame, but that was supposed to be the year where you know they were finally going to beat Notre Dame. You scored three touchdowns. Mm-hmm. And the thing I remember most is it's it was the first Notre Dame Notre Dame game I ever attended. Actually, it's the only one I've ever attended to this day. But I remember wow. at the end of the game, you were the second player ever carried off the field after Rudy Rudiger after that game. Can you tell us some memories about that game and what it was like to be carried off the field at Notre Dame Stadium? You know, it was a pretty surreal experience. Uh, it was one of those games. We had lost the opening game of the year that year to Northwestern, who at the time was, you know, we, everybody thought was terrible. Northwest, Northwestern ended up going 11-1 and that season. That was, uh, you know, Pat Fitzgerald and Darnell Autry, you know, the, you know that group. Uh, I think it was Gary, Gary Barnett was still there. Uh, you know, when Northwestern had his two really good uh, years in a row. Uh, you know, so we lost Northwestern, and then we lost uh, at Ohio State, and, you know, obviously early in the year we were struggling a little bit, and then USC comes in. We've beaten them, I think, ten years in a row, and then we tied them the previous season. Uh, so this was – or we beat them 11 years in a row and tied them. So it was something like that. USC hadn't beaten us in, you know, 12, 12 or 13 years. So uh, they come in. It was John Robinson's first year there, um, first or second year there, I forget. But, uh, you know, Keyshawn Johnson, senior year. They were number five in the country. They were like seven and zero. We were five and two, and uh, it was the year they were finally going to beat Notre Dame. And they came in on a chilly, crisp all, uh, October day when it was a little bit misty out. You know, kind of kind of a overcast, and uh, we just put one on them. I mean, offensively, defensively, uh, you know, special teams. We we just played a great all around game, and uh, you know. By the end of the game, I, I, I had a 31, 38 to 10, I think, was the final. And uh, I had a good all-around solid game, a couple touchdowns. I uh, threw for a two-point conversion. I ran for a two-point conversion. You know, I had 70, 80, 90 yards rushing, 30, 40 yards receiving, and uh, just a all-around gritty effort really by the entire team. And, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, the guy that scores the touchdowns gets the – you know, a lot of the accolades. You know, I was the guy at the end that uh, you know fans were 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 picking up on their shoulders, and it was just a really really cool experience. But uh, all in all, I mean, it was just a great team effort. It was. I don't know if you remember that hit that Ken and Tatum put on their linebacker, put on their running back when they were getting ready to score the first touchdown. A ball pops loose. Defense had a great goal line stand right at the end of the first half to prevent them from scoring, and time ran out on them. I mean, it was just a really really. Uh, cool experience you know you mentioned uh legendary coach lou holtz as uh, one of your early influences what, what's your favorite memory of uh coach uh holtz while you were at notre dame well while i was at notre dame i didn't have any favorite memory of coach holtz uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you grow to appreciate him a heck of a lot more after you've already left notre dame holtz it's like his philosophy was he put so much pressure on you during practice that come game time, it was a lot easier. He didn't yell and scream very much at all. I mean, I remember maybe one time uh, my freshman year, he was yelling and screaming at halftime. But, I mean, it was all about you know, making the adjustments and, and, and things like that at halftime. There wasn't a lot of yelling and screaming during the game. But, man, at practice, I mean, I used to remember as a freshman, you know, it, really what he does is he puts so much pressure on you during the game or during practice, and, and he does that mainly to the underclassmen that are forced to play. He does it a little bit, you know, once you're an established veteran, but he really puts all that pressure on the younger guys. So, like I said, once they get in the game, you know, it's a, they, they, they don't feel as much pressure. And I remember as a, as a freshman coming over to practice, and I wasn't a starter as a freshman, but I played, you know, a significant amount of time. Um, I remember just dreading going over to practice, I was walking over there because I knew I was going to get chewed out and embarrassed uh, by Coach Holt. I didn't know what it was going to be for. I didn't know when it was going to happen, but I knew 
something was going to happen at some point that was going to set him off and I was going to get my backside chewed out. And he was such a stickler to details. Uh, you know, if I was in my stance and, you know, I was supposed to take a lead step with my right foot and instead I took a crossover step with my left foot to start the play regardless of the outcome of the play, you know, he was down the field chewing me out if I didn't step with the right foot to start the play. So, uh, you know, that, 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 that was my lasting memory, you know, that and how many times my freshman year that he sent me down to scout team because, you know, the offensive, you know, field would be, you know, practice on one field, defense would practice two fields away. So there was a good, you know, 150 you know, yards in between the fields. And whenever there's offensive guy, and Holtz was always the offense, he was never down with the defense. So, uh, you know, whenever you messed up, you know, the defensive guys would see you jogging down there. They knew that, uh, that it was kind of like a jog of shame. Because you know, they knew you screwed up the whole attention down the scout team. Well, um, I grew up, like I said, my whole life I've lived in Indiana, so Notre Dame was a big thing. I remember late seventies, even early eighties, watching Lindsey Nelson every Sunday morning with the Notre Dame replay show. Um, were you a Notre Dame fan when you were a kid? Oh, um, I, I was exactly the opposite. Here's a good story for you. Um, 1988 to 1989, I'm a freshman in high school. I'm rooting for the University of Miami to beat Notre Dame and stop their 23-24 game win streak, whatever it was. Um, now, you know, maybe it was kind of like the New York Yankees effect where, you know, they'd been winning for so much since I was, you know, two or three, four or five years, and I just got tired of it, and I, I didn't like them because of it. I, I don't know why, but – you know, fast forward, you know, another two years, my junior year, when I'm starting to get recruited by him. And then, you know, like I was talking about, you know, the reasons earlier why I went there, I mean, all that stuff kind of started popping in my head, and I'm thinking to myself, you know what, this is kind of a no-brainer. This is where I need to go, period. This is the right place for me. Now, now, you know, fast forward to signing day, or, or shortly after signing day, in February and March of my senior year, after I signed a letter of intent, I'm looking back through some of my old folders and things like that from high school, and I found uh, a folder that I had written on Notre Dame sucks, <laughs> and, and it just you know it was kind of it almost came full circle there from when I didn't like Notre Dame to now seeing you know maybe being envious of Notre Dame to being accepted by Notre Dame and being part of that, and then now having a lifetime of love affair with Notre Dame. Yeah, um, at Notre Dame, the. Main play I remember from you was the run. I believe it was in '95 against Texas. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's that's probably what everybody talks to you about. But I mean, do, does any one game stand out as the best game you ever played while you were at Notre Dame? Ah, uh, you know, there, there, there were there were several um, that that I, I really look back on, and and you know, just. Right. Well, I got into the zone, I guess, you know, or, or, or the team was. And obviously, you know, that, that game we already talked about, the, the the game versus USC in 95. And I actually followed that up. Uh, I, I don't remember if we played USC or Boston College first, but it was it was back-to-back weeks. Um, you know, the Boston College games where I had my, my best rushing game ever. Um, and, and after coming off – the two losses to Boston College when they basically you know, stripped me of my national title in 93. And then 94, we went back to Chapel Hill or uh, uh, Chestnut Hill and just got blasted at Boston College my sophomore year. So coming into my, that was in 95 and junior year when Boston College came back to South Bend and we just did it. We only beat them 20 to 10, but we actually just, we just absolutely destroyed them up front. I mean, we, we dominated that game, both lines of scrimmage. I had 160 some yards rushing, which is actually my only 100 yard game I ever had. I had a bunch of games in the you know 80s and 90s, um, you know yards, you know yard rushing range, but uh, that was my only game I ever ever had 100 yards. And obviously, the Texas game was a big one, both my junior year and my senior year in Austin. I mean, it was a great game in my senior year as well when we won uh, on the last second field goal. So that was so those were the you know kind of the four games that kind of stick out in my in my memory. Now, Mark, you you mentioned how uh, um, growing up you were a Bengals fan. Um, you know, from a fan standpoint, you know, the fan inside of you, what was it like to be drafted 
by a team that, you know, beat your team in the Super Bowl. And I only ask that because, like, I've always wondered, like, you know, if you're growing up liking a certain team, what happens when you get drafted by, like, a rival or something? What goes through your mind on uh, for something like that? You change allegiances real, real quick. <laughs> <laughs> that's basically what it comes down to. At that point, you, you know, I didn't really uh, – it, it, that kind of thought never ever crossed my mind. I was excited and, and thankful. You know, I was I was a uh, the fifty fifth overall pick. So I was the twenty fifth pick of the second round back when we only the NFL only had thirty teams. And uh, you know, I was just excited to get my career started. And quite frankly, I didn't care where it was. But it was a little bit nicer that uh, I was on a team that had a history of winning. Uh, I knew I was going to have the opportunity to compete for a Super Bowl title uh, pretty pretty quickly, which, you know, my, my rookie year we lost in the NFC Championship game. Um, and then my, um, my second year we, uh, we we lost in the divisional round after winning the wild card game. Uh, we lost in the divisional round to the Dirty Birds and Jamal Anderson uh, in, in Atlanta. So, so you know, <laughs> the, the uh, childhood allegiances, uh, allegiances left, uh, left my thought process real quickly. Well, I can, tell, I can tell you this. As a Cincinnati Bengals fan, I was cheering for the Dirty Bird on that one, Mark. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> of course you I were. Yeah, I tell you what, if you, if you, if you remember <laughs> that game, like the first year – you know, first series of the game, uh, Garrison Hurst broke his ankle, oh, um, yeah. and they had him, and we ended up losing that game twenty to eighteen. Uh, you yeah, know, had he not done that, you know, very well could have been a different outcome. Well, in typical Bengals, they had Garrison Hurst, I believe, in '96, and let him get away. I still never understood yep. that one. But <laughs> all right, you talked about the draft. I mean, what, what was your draft day like in 1997? Well, you know. Now, had I had to do it all over again, you know, I would, uh, you know, go out on the golf course and stay out there all day and, like, you know, have a cell phone on me and get the call because I had a big party. We got down. We went down to Montgomery Inn Boathouse in downtown Cincinnati. We had the whole upstairs, all my friends and family and all that. Uh, Got down there at noon when the draft started, all right, and – all day long, you were watching the draft, and your people were coming up to you. Who do you think is going to be? Who do you think? I, I have no idea. You know, you get the same stuff, and, and everybody else was drinking and having a good time. So, you know, we get, you know, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock. Everybody, uh, you know, was, was uh, a little, probably a little overserved by that time, and it was getting real annoying for me. <laughs> but uh, it was a very nervous day, you know, just waiting for the call, waiting for the call, and – the way I found out was actually pretty cool because ESPN stopped the draft uh, or, or the, the draft stopped airing on ESPN, I want to say, at uh, 7 o'clock and it switched ESPN2. Um, so the place didn't get ESPN2, so the owner is, is just frantically – on the on the phone with the cable people trying to get you know the, the ESPN two and this that and the other, and they didn't get it in time. So all of a sudden the owner says, you know, "Hey Mark, you got a phone call," and like the whole place goes dead silent, which was really cool. And I pick up the phone. Uh, Thank you very much, sir. Oh, I'm very excited. Blah blah blah. You know, so forth and so on. And nobody knew who it was yet. So I hang up the phone. I had three boxes of hats in front of me. You know, obviously all 30 teams. Uh, so I finger through the first hat. I can't find it. I finger through the second hat. I couldn't find it. I did. I found it in the third box. And I just paused and then popped it on real quick. And the whole place went crazy, which was really cool. But, like I said, going back that whole day, I was just a dang wreck. And, you know, I should have been out somewhere else uh, with keeping my mind occupied opposed to, you know, thinking about this uh, all darn day long. Now, moving on to uh, uh, your 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 career with the 49ers, you, know, you had your rookie year in '97 behind Fred Beasley, or not Fred Beasley, uh, William Floyd. William Floyd, yep, and, yep, William Floyd. And then '98, uh, you get the William Floyd moves on. You get uh, Pennsylvania as a starter in the wild card game. I can pretty much recall this game almost play by play from memory, especially that final drive. Um, yeah, it was amazing uh, as they, you know. Favre leads them down. They score the go-ahead touchdown and got like just over a minute to go. 
a couple completions to J.J. Stokes, and then what looks to be a really uh, rough play is you catch the ball a few yards uh, behind the line of scrimmage, and then Leroy Butler looks like he's going to make a play. And you, you end up making probably the real key play to set up the rest of the drive. Can you, do, you, do you have any memories about uh, that last drive or anything you'd like to share about that play or anything on that Yeah, drive? yeah. You know, I get uh, I get people who text me or give me a call from time to time. Hey, Mark, turn on ESPN Classic. You know, that, uh, you know the, the catch two is on. So, uh, it, you know, but, uh, but yeah, you know, I, I want to say it was like a second down. Like it was a second short, like second two or something like that. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, Steve, Steve Young was under a little bit of duress, and I was past blocking. And, you know, I see him start to scramble a little bit, so I just kind of, you know, turn around, and he dumps me past about four yards, four or five yards deep in the backfield. And Leroy, Leroy Butler hits me immediately. You know, I was uh, strong enough to stay on my feet and fortunate enough to shake him off. And then two other guys come charging at me, so I sidestep them, and Leroy, Leroy takes a second crack at me. And uh, shake him again, and I break away for, you know, it was probably only a you know, five or six, you know, maybe an eight-yard gain when it was all said and done. But basically it took us from, a, you know, a third and, you know, seven or eight to, you know, a fresh set of downs. And, uh, you know, as we score, as we were on the 25-yard line with eight seconds left, it, you know, it turned out that those yards were pretty key with Terrell Owens catching that touch, that 25 yard touchdown pass with, you know, I think it was, like I said, with eight seconds left from, from Steve Young. So it was, it turned out to be more important than you thought. It was kind of one of those plays that, you know, as you're going through it, you know, you don't think it's that big of a deal, but uh, looking at how things ended up turned out to be a pretty, pretty key play. Well, then we'll jump ahead. You played for the New England Patriots during the Spygate scandal. Do you have any insight or any stories about the allegations? <laughs> well, well, I was there before the alleged spy gate, but I will tell you this. Uh, the second year I was in New England, you know, we had the magical run in 2001. You know, Bloodstone gets hurt, Brady comes in. We go on to win a Super Bowl over the Rams. Uh, so we open up the next season at home uh, Gillette Stadium is opening up uh, very first game in Gillette Stadium ever because we played in the old Foxborough Stadium in 2001 and we're playing at Pittsburgh Steelers it's a tough game kind of going back and forth the first half um, you know we're up I, w- I want to say we're up 10-7 to uh, going in halftime but the last drive of the first half you know we went into the two minute offense um, and apparently you know we had some some eyes on their sideline because we kind of figured out what their calls were by the cards they were hanging up, you know, or uh, cards they were putting up, their defensive calls and things like that. So uh, the second half we come out, and we, we come out in two-minute no-huddle offense. And, you know, we're, we're, we, have, we have somebody up there that's looking at what the Pittsburgh Steelers are holding up, and Charlie Weiss is, uh, you know, on the uh, – on the walkie-talkie, talking to Tom Brady. All right, Tom, they're uh, they're in cover two. The will and the mic are blitzing. This is the play we're running. Throw it right here. And we just went up and down the field on them in the entire second half. So yeah, that was the kind of spygate uh, stuff that that that, that, that kind of went on. And uh, you know, call that spygate or call that you know outsmarting your opponent. Uh, so you know, you you make your own choice there. Well, I, I think the Spygate thing is overblown anyways. We talked about that last week when we talked. Um, every team tries to get an advantage. It's just most of them are as smart as Bill Belichick. Uh, Bill, you know, Coach Belichick, uh, it, you know, it was always so interesting when we come in on Wednesday and start the game planning because he was coming up with stuff every week, you know, offensively, defensively. You know, Charlie Weiss, you know, back then had a lot to do with that as well. But, you know, there's always something that they had that was unique, different. Um, and, and a great example of that is, you know, obviously that year we won the Super Bowl. Um, we, we played the Rams, I think it was in week 10. Um, and that was our last loss. They beat us in uh, Foxborough on a Sunday night. And we probably blitzed 75, 80% of the time against against the Rams. And they didn't put up huge offensive numbers. I think they beat us 24-17. But, you know, it was one of those games where it was never really in doubt. You know, they they, they, they kind of controlled the game. But we blitzed, like I said, 75, 80% of the time. Fast forward to the Super Bowl, 
Belichick completely changes his game plan. And what was interesting is we were only rushing three guys almost the entire game. And as the week was going on in practice, I was seeing what they were doing. And it was and I was like, wow, that is just brilliant. Even though we were only rushing three guys, whichever, whichever way Marshall Falk would release, that defensive end would stop rushing and basically just tackle him, hit him, slow him down, break his rhythm. But that's how they took Marshall Falk out of that game. And if you remember, you know, a lot of people won't remember this, but, you know, we were, we were beating them, I want to say, we were, we were up 14-3 to three, you know, early in the fourth quarter. Uh, the Rams were finally putting together a drive, and they had the ball fourth and goal on the two-yard line, and they decided to go for it. We have everybody covered. Kurt Warner takes off running. Roman Pfeiffer tackles him. He fumbles. Tabucky Jones picks the ball up, goes 99 yards the other way for a touchdown. Essentially, the game's over, but there's a flag on the field. Willie McGinnis had basically tackled Marshall Falk coming out of the backfield, and that's what we were doing all game long. That was the only time they called it. All right. Right now, the listeners are listening to the live show. Remember, at the bottom of the hour, in about a little over four minutes, we will go to archive time. You can go to the top of the hour at midnight, listen to a complete interview then. Um, don't forget, we have a special edition of The Grueling Truth tomorrow at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We'll have a former Oakland Raiders coach, head coach, Tom Flores here. Uh, won two Super Bowls with the Raiders, Super Bowls 15 and 18. So we'll have a great show tomorrow. Don't forget, 2.30 tomorrow. All of our shows are podcasts. You can go back and listen over the last few weeks, we've had Gary Jeter, Roger Craig, Leon Searcy, LeVon Kirkland, of course, Mark Edwards. So, Matt, you got the next one. Mark, I think every every year, either, uh, anybody who's either a fan of football or who's playing football all their lives with the dream of getting into the NFL fantasizes about what it's like to play in a Super Bowl. And you you got to live out that fantasy what was it like for you stepping on the field and just experience your, just your game experience? What was that like for you? Well, I mean, really the experience, you know, obviously the entire week's different, but I mean, I'll fast forward to game day. Uh, the thing that the coaches were trying to relay to us was that everything is slower. Everything takes longer on game day. You know, all the hype leading up to it and all that. It's like you got to find a way to relax your mind, relax your body during the day because, you know, it, it, it'll, it'll wear you out, you know, being that emotionally involved all day long. So, you know, the pregame, you have to go out for pregame earlier than you normally would. You know, once you go out on the field, the um, national anthem and everything else takes longer. Uh, halftime is takes so much longer. So, you know, what they really needed you to emphasize, you know, was, was, you know, controlling your emotions over that longer time frame than, than what you were used to. And, and, and it, it was just absolutely, you know, an emotional day all around, you know, because, you know, you, you know you're playing the biggest game of your life. Many guys get there, or many guys never get there, some guys get there and, and and one time and never get back. So you know, you you know the importance of it. You know just how big it is, and you you, you want to try to take advantage of it and, and and prepare for it the the best you've ever prepared for anything. And you go out there and you try to play every play like it's the best you've ever played. But you know, quite honestly, once you know after the introductions. You go out there after the kickoff, you know, it's back to playing football again. The one thing that was interesting that was a little bit different because it was at a neutral field, obviously, is that there's crowd noise for both teams, whereas normally there's only crowd noise for one team. But, I mean, other than that, it's out there, you're out there, you're playing football. Uh, you, you know it's a, a bigger game than you ever played, but once again, you know, once that whistle goes off, you're you're, you're in there playing ball. All right. Um, I asked a question about Bill Belichick earlier. I think he's – one of, if not the greatest football coach in NFL history. I mean, if you look at now compared to, say, when Lombardi coached, Lombardi didn't have to overturn a third, sometimes a little bit more of his roster. Just talk a little mm -hmm. bit about what it was like to play for Bill Belichick and what made him different from other coaches. You know, the thing about Belichick is what you see 
you know, on on TV. I mean, that's that that's Bill. You know, he everything outside of you being dedicated to football upsets him. All right, he he doesn't want to deal with it. He doesn't like you know the media stuff. He doesn't like you know making appearances and all that stuff. You know, he wants to coach football. It's number one thing in his life. You know, for the you know, and and he pretty much thinks that it, it, you should feel the exact same way. And if you don't, if you don't make it a priority, then you're out of there, period. You know, guys being late, guys not, you know, studying the film, guys not being mentally prepared, all that stuff just irritates him beyond belief. And, you know, you, you know that. I mean, what you see is what you get. He's not a yell and scream type of guy, but he's the type of guy, you know, that can talk to you in a normal tone and – basically cuss you out in a normal tone and intimidate the heck out of you. Yeah, you know, cuz cuz he 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 is just just he's smarter than everybody else. He he wor- and not only that but he works harder than anybody else. You know, he he you know finds the little little things in the rule book that he, that you can take advantage of. And obviously this year was another example in the playoff game versus Baltimore. I mean, he found something nobody else knew about. And they changed the rule because of it now. You know, they changed the tuck rule <laughs> because of us. Uh, you know, so, but, uh, you know, Belichick is, you know, the other thing that he really does uniquely is if you look at the guys on his roster, you know, a year in, year out basis, you're going to find more college graduates on the Patriots than you are generally on the other teams around the league. So he gets guys that buys into the system. Guys that will do what their coach, what he coaches them to do, and he gets more guys to do that than than, than anybody. All right, I got a follow up here. I just got a message from somebody on Twitter just listening to the show that has to be an Oakland Raiders fan, and he wants mm-hmm. to know if when that play happened, if you thought it was a fumble or not. <laughs> I don't make the rules. I only play by them. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, 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 that's what I'll leave it at. <laughs> All right. Well, well, we'll read between the lines with that then, Mark. <laughs> I don't make the rules. I only play by them. That was the rule, so, you know, it is what it is. Another Fair one of Bill Belichick's famous line, it is what it is. You, hear, you hear, heard a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mark, when you were playing that Notre Dame um, that was pretty much the the, the way the, the fullback was traditionally used, uh, like like Mike Allstott or you know going back in the seventies with like a Larry Zonka. Uh, what are your feelings on how the fullback position, the way it's evolved over time, and kind of what it is now? Well, it, it breaks my heart, just like the move to field turf has broken my heart, uh, specifically at Notre Dame Stadium, but. You know, in the name of progress, I guess that's uh, you know both both the fullback position, the field turf, things like that. Uh, you know, need to change. Uh, I don't think it'll ever get back. The fullback position will ever get back to what it was in the '80s and '90s, and you know, kind of you know back when I was playing. Um, I, I think it'll come back more than it is now. You know, because you'll see. I mean, you know, the, the teams that are generally the most successful or, or have been winning Super Bowls. I mean, you know, you see Seattle, you know, fullback, you know, a couple of years ago with uh, Baltimore winning the Super Bowl, they used the fullback quite a bit. Uh, San Francisco, when, when you know, they, they were right at the top, you know, last, you know, two years ago, fullback, you know, New England doesn't, doesn't always, um, but, uh, you know, they also got Tom Brady, you know. But, uh, you know, the fullback will come back a little bit more. It's not going to be fun and gun all the time, but it's never going to come back to, you know, what it was. Uh, and, you know, it, it breaks my heart to see that, but, you know, that's the evolution of football. Uh, you mentioned Tom Brady there. I mean, what was it like to be on the same field with a guy that you – I mean, well, I, back then you guys – did you guys realize how great he was going to be? Well, you, you, you can. I mean, what, what was what was kind of cool, and then you saw early on, was when, when I got there. Let's even for uh, rewind to even before I got there. Two, the year two thousand was Belichick's first year. He drafted Brady in the sixth round. The only reason Tom Brady made that team in two thousand 
was because Belichick kept four quarterbacks. He had Drew Bledsoe, I think it was John Freeze, um, Michael Bishop was the number three guy, and Brady was the fourth guy. So go to the next year. Freeze, uh, you know, was a free agent. He went somewhere else. Um, Michael Bishop was still on the team, but he ended up getting cut after training camp. Uh, Belichick brought in Damon Heward, along, uh, Damon Heward from Miami along uh, to be the backup quarterback, along with a bunch of us free agent guys like myself and Mike Compton and Mike Vrabel, uh, guys like that. And, you know, Brady went into training camp as a third-team quarterback, and he beat out Damon Heward clearly. I mean, he, he was just you, – you saw him really starting to rise, but Bledsoe had just signed a $100 million contract. He wasn't going to, you know, beat out Bledsoe. So, you know, you, you go into that uh, second game, Bledsoe gets hit in the chest by Mo Lewis as he's running out of bounds at the end of the game. Uh, you know, TV didn't do it justice when I was standing there. It sounded like, you know, Mo Lewis hit him with a shotgun shell. You know, that, it, it was just the most horrific sound I'd ever heard. And, you know, Bledsoe shears a blood vessel in his chest and, and steps Brady. We just kind of slowly start winning. And the New England Patriots offense back when I was there, our, our, our core offense, our core personnel was two tight ends, two backs, and a receiver, Troy Brown. We ran the ball with Antoine, Antoine Smith. We ran the ball, and we play action the heck out of it. Brady was throwing for 190 to 220 yards a game, one touchdown. You know, we, we weren't making him win ball games back then. We were winning with offense, defense, and special teams. You know, we were – number 18 in the league in offense that year. We were number 15 in the league in defense, but we were top five in the red zone on both sides and we in turnover margin. So, you know, you saw Brady as a game manager kind of those first couple of the first year, you know, and then you started seeing flashes of it where he would bring us back from, you know, a deficit. You know, we were down by 10 with, with like eight minutes to go against San Diego and it was Brady's first 300-yard game. Uh, you know, that, that year. But you saw glimpses of what it could be. You know, he had great uh, field presence and stuff like that. But he wasn't the Tom Brady that we know now that's, you know, throwing for, you know, you know, five, you know three and 400 yards a game and, and being the best quarterback in the history of the league or, or certainly in the conversation. But uh, you started seeing glimpses of it then. Uh, I, I have a question here. I mean, I remember the AFC Championship game that year. Brady got hurt, I think, around halftime. Mm-hmm. Bledsoe yeah. came in. You guys came back, won the game. Was there any, I mean, noticeable friction between the two the weeks leading up to the Super Bowl? No, no. I mean, you know, Brady was, was healthy. He was going to play. Bledsoe knew that. Uh, Bled, Bledsoe did – Bledsoe did the right thing that year, and he, you know, sucked up his pride. He, he he played the team guy. You know, maybe there was a conversation between him and Belichick or something that, hey, you know, stick out this season. You know, we're going to trade you. We're going to put you in a better, you know, situation is better for you. If, you know, do do us right this year. I, I don't know if that conversation went on or not, but Bledsoe, you know, he sucked it up, and you know what, he 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 gave it up for the team that year, and. uh yeah, I mean, obviously he wanted to play in the Super Bowl, you know, after coming back in that AFC Championship game and, and uh, you know, leading us to victory. But uh, if Brady was able to play, he was going to play, and that was just that's just the end of it. You know, besides uh, winning the Super Bowl, do you have a favorite uh, memory of your career that uh, stands out to you? <sighs> NFL-wise, I mean, not, not really. I mean, yeah, that, that was the pinnacle of it. You know, going in my my rookie year and playing with a lot of legends was uh, was pretty pretty cool as well. Uh, you know, a team that we lost in the AFC uh, NFC Championship game to Green Bay and Brett Favre, but that team had Steve Young and Jerry Rice and Brent Jones, Kevin Gogan, in the offensive line, you know, Trell Owens, uh, Garrison Hurst was was the uh, you know uh, the, was my tail was the tailback of that team. And then you look at my defensive side of the ball: Dana Stubblefield, Brian Young. Yeah, Kevin Green on that team. Uh, goodness, um, Ken Norton Rod Jr., Woodson. Burton Hanks, Tim McDonald. I mean, on and on. I mean, you know, just Rod Woodson was on that team. You know, towards the end of his career as well. I mean, you know, playing with those guys, you know, as a rookie was was pretty darn uh, intimidating. And uh, but at the same time, it, you know, it, it prepared me for uh, you know the rest of my career. You know, so uh, you know, but 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 obviously the Super Bowl was by far. The uh, 
you know, that, that just just that run my my two years in New England because, you know, most of the teams I played for, you go out, you practice, you go in the locker room, shower up, you go watch film, and then you know, get out of there as fast as you could. Uh, when I was in New England, you know, we we had a great locker room, a great great group of guys, uh, white guys, black guys. I mean, it didn't matter. I mean, you know, veterans, rookies. Uh, everybody hung out, you know, after, after practice, we'd shower up, watch a film. We'd go back to the locker room. We'd hang out for an hour, hour and a half. We'd play games. We had you know, a bunch of game tables set up in the middle of the, uh, locker room. And you know, I learned to play dominoes, you know, uh, you know, big offensive line, you know, a bunch of guys playing back game. We, we, we'd all hang out and we, you know, bust on each other and we'd go out, we'd have our own team parties that weren't, uh, that we would organize nothing to do with the organization itself. But the players would organize them, and uh, you know, every Friday night we had you know anywhere between eight and ten, twelve guys uh, that would go out with you know either their girlfriends or their wives, whoever, and we'd all you know go out, go down down to Boston or downtown to Providence and have dinner, and you know, we we would just hang out uh, during the season and the off season. It was just a real uh, close group of guys. Well, we've got about two minutes left. Uh, final question: um, What are you doing nowadays since you've retired? Well, mostly I am uh, chasing my kids around the soccer field, and you know, be, being a uh, you know, soccer dad. I uh, I have four children. My oldest two are um, I have three daughters, sixteen, fourteen, and eleven, and I have a little boy who's five. And the older two are pretty darn good uh, travel soccer players. And my my oldest one is starting the recruiting process, so that's that's exciting. But uh, after I finished with the NFL, I uh, was kind of trying to find myself. I kind of got involved in. I had a supplemental insurance company that I was a part owner of, so I tried to go that route a little bit and got my Series 7 and my insurance licenses and realized that wasn't for me real quick. So I transitioned into this company called Speed Shield that was a startup at the time. They have a safety and efficiency device for forklifts, kind of like a black box system, so somebody can look at their entire fleet online if they hit something uh emails are going out and you know the unit can shut off and things like that and uh i've since taken that and now i work with uh i have my own little company that i work with forklift dealers around the country uh, installing that system and implementing it and teaching the online system and things like that a lot of trail hey uh, (laughs) and of course the final question is this are you still a cincinnati Bengals fan uh, you know, I do have a soft spot for the Bengals. Um, you know, I'll, I'll root for them, but uh, you know, I guess you know the, the team I most associate myself with is the Patriots because I had my best time there, my most success there. But I am a Reds fan, and I did listen to the opening day game uh, two days ago. <laughs> well, I think last time I saw it was three to three. It's like they're playing a West Coast game in Cincinnati tonight because they had a three hour. No, rain delay. I, I, I saw there was a rain delay, and the I, 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 the last I saw was like a second inning, and the Reds were up one nothing. But uh, I'll take a look yeah, at Todd it. Yeah, Todd Frazier uh, hit a home run. Here. Oh, nice, yeah. nice. But hey, at least you didn't say you were a Forty Nine er fan. So <laughs> no, 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 I mean I had a great time out there, but. Yeah, although I guess uh, you know a lot of people associate uh, the the Patriots now as the uh, the, the, the new hated team uh, around the country just because they've been so good for so long, you know. <laughs> well, hey, it was it was an honor talking to you tonight. Anytime you want to come back, if you want to come back, be on our draft show, or you want to talk during the season a little bit, we would love to have you back on. I, mean, I think this was a great interview, um, Matt. Really enjoyed uh, hearing all your thoughts yeah. about your whole career, Mark. I've always hey. uh, been a fan of yours. Always fun to uh, talk about that stuff, relive those memories, and uh, shoot me a note, man. I'll, I'll hop on any time with you. All right. Appreciate thanks it. a lot, Mark. You bet, guys. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. All right. Remember, guys, tomorrow at 2.30 on The Grueling Truth, a special Thursday episode. With legendary, I think should be Hall of Fame coach Tom Flores, who won two Super Bowls with the L or with the Oakland Raiders, and then I think Super Bowl eighteen was the LA Raiders. I mean, I know I'm excited about the show tomorrow. How about you, Matt? Definitely, Mark, uh, you know, Tom Flores is one of those guys that I don't know how he's not in the Hall of Fame. It'd be good to, to get his uh, thoughts about his career. Well, and tomorrow night we will have a Thursday night edition of The Grueling Truth where instead of having another 49er on, I figured we might as well talk to you know, more important players. So.
So we'll have from the Super Bowl 23 Cincinnati Bengals, linebacker Joe Kelly will be with us tomorrow night. Um, so now you'll actually get to talk to a real legend, a Cincinnati Bengal, man. That's right. I can't wait to ask him about his thoughts on Super Bowl 23. Well, I mean, there's really nothing to think about Super Bowl 23. I think we talk. I think we'll talk about everything but Super Bowl 23. <laughs> of course, we will. <laughs> no, I think probably half that interview will be Super Bowl 23 because I have a lot of questions that have been bothering me since I was little that I've been having nightmares about. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be a good. Time. But hey, we will see you guys tomorrow. Remember.